Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I'm Charlene from Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful and I'm the Environmental Education Manager here, managing projects such as Eco Schools and Young Reporters for the Environment. Um, we're working today in conjunction with our Tackling Plastics NI project, which is funded by the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. So this is our third in a short series of Tackling Plastic webinars for Eco Schools NI, which is run by Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to have Dan O'Neill with us. Dan is a wildlife explorer, filmmaker and field biologist. And he's with us today to talk about the impact pointless plastics has on our rivers, his adventures in the Amazon and how small changes in our practices can go a long way to protecting rivers near and far and freshwater species. So hopefully by the end of this webinar, you'll feel even more empowered to take eco action to reduce your use of pointless plastic in the classroom and at home. So before I hand you over to Dan, I'd like to introduce my colleague and co-host today, Claire. Hi everyone, I'm Claire. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat today. So you should see in the bottom of your screen a little chat box. So you can comment in there throughout the webinar. And then there's also a Q&A section where you can add any questions. And we'll have about, hopefully about 10 minutes at the end, to ask Dan all your wonderful questions. So thanks very much. Over to you, Dan. Hi guys, how's it all going? Uh, so yeah, my name's uh, Dan O'Neill. I'm a wildlife biologist, uh, documentary kind of presenter uh, and uh, um, field biologist. So I worked out in the, the Amazon and, and primarily in tropical forests in the Philippines and Vietnam, India and the Amazon. Um, but I'm also a filmmaker. And so with my job, get to go out to, um, re really lucky to get to go out to some pretty cool places uh, and pretty remote places. Um, but today I'm here to talk to you about something you've probably been talking quite a lot about recently, um, plastic. Um, but in a quite a different way uh, in our rivers, specifically in my most favourite area in the entire world. So I'm just going to click share screen now and get this up. Here we go. Hello, have we worked? Is that in? I think it is. Um, righto, first things first. Um, oh, one second. Da, 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 da. That's one thing I want to show you first, actually, guys. Uh, so first, before I come in, I want to show you two things. So I'm about to show you a video in a minute um, with lots of animals um, from the Amazon rainforest. And at the end of the webinar, when you've got your questions, I just want you guys to think about two things. I want you to think about what these might be. So this is the first one. Um, I brought this back from uh, South America in the Amazon rainforest. Have a look at it. See what you think that might be. Um, oh, pardon me. I'm just being cool. Um, and this one here as well. So the other one is a bit bigger and this one here is very, very small and they're from completely different animals. So look at this one, look at the shape that it has, think what those two things might be from uh, and at the end I will let you know what they are. So yes, here is uh, uh, this big old camera, this thing that I use quite a lot when I'm away. Um, I'm, uh, this particular picture here was in the Philippines, another um, beautiful place of jungle habitat. Um, but yes, today, oh, plastics. Um, so you guys have probably been hearing a lot about plastic in our oceans. Uh, we, uh, we have been talking about it a huge amount, especially after the big uh, David Attenborough series, Blue Planet 2 came out. It really highlighted people to plastic pollution in our oceans. But where does that plastic come from? Well, actually, most of the plastic in the oceans comes from one other place, and that is rivers. Uh, and actually, we've been looking into plastic pollution in the oceans for about 30 years. People have really started to study it to understand how it affects animals like turtles when they, uh, they might grab a plastic bag and swallow it, thinking it's a jellyfish, their main source of food. Or it could get into a dolphin or a whale. It could also break down into tiny, tiny little things called microplastics, which can affect lots of animals in different ways in the ocean. But my specific area of interest is in jungles and a lot of plastic can actually be found in other places in there, specifically the rivers. And so I'm just going to show you a video right now, um, which is a compilation of some of the most incredible animals that I've seen in the Amazon rainforest uh, and, some, uh, and try and give you a little picture about um, how beautiful that place is. Thank you. 
closer and closer to a tape. And every time he dunks down, we battle, 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 battle. And every time he comes up, hush, 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 hush. Pretty much the only one you get up here. Four different species of caiman here in Guyana. Two dwarfs, one spectacle. The largest, the black caiman. Camibara. There's 13 of them. Camibara. 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 And this guy on uh, the bank here, it's Podocnemus expansa, or the expansa river turtle. And uh, it's probably not that big a version of how big they can get, but this uh, is the largest river turtle in Guyana. These guys come up the banks uh, to nest, and then the jaguars just come and pick them off, because like other turtles, when they're nesting, they just go into a bit of a trance. She's very aware of me right now. We can tell that she knows that I'm here. And if I get any closer, she'll probably launch herself into the water. So I hope that, got, uh, that gives you a kind of taste of um, how beautiful the Amazon rainforest is and um, why I absolutely love it so, so much. Um, this here is a picture of Kaitia Falls. It's the largest single drop waterfall in the entire world in terms of volume. So the amount of water that's coming over the top there and falling straight down into that river below. And this exists in that country that I was there while I was make, uh, filming those beautiful animals, uh, Guyana. 
and you can fly as we did in a tiny little Cessna, a, a, a four seater bush plane, little air, tiny little aeroplane and we flew over and I don't know if you can see right up at the top, slightly to the, to the right, there's a tiny little landing strip and we landed the little aircraft there. Um, so it's a really, really beautiful and incredible place. Uh, and it's one place that we really don't associate a lot with plastic. And as we went further and further up the river, um, last year we were up there searching for a Jaguar. Uh, we we position where really plastic you would never think that it's an issue you would absolutely never think that plastic is an issue up there but recently in 2018 a study a scientific study was done by some incredible biologists who looked into fish and uh, they were searching to see just how much of an effect plastic was making in the uh, rivers in the amazon and this one was specifically done in brazil but lots of similar projects have been done since and this project found that they looked across loads of different kinds of fish and right down to the smallest individuals 80 percent of fish had signs of plastic things the size of about one to 15 millimeters. So if you imagine your, fin your, your fingernail, so as big as that, pieces of plastic were being found in fish. So this guy right here on the screen, I don't know if any of you will instantly know who this, uh, who this fish might be. Um, this is a very, very dangerous fish in the eyes of some people. Not so much if you're actually there in the Amazon, unless you've got a cut, because this is a piranha and they go around in gangs that can be up to very large numbers of them and they go and frenzy around animals and eat them. Uh, it's very, very grisly, but they're very, very cool animals, but they're not the apex predators and these guys are eaten by this guy here. This is a Bayara. It's a giant, great big fish, and it's very grisly in appearance, as you can see. And those, uh, those giant fangs at the end, it's, uh, give it another name. It's also called the vampire fish because of those. And you see those giant big eyes there, and what looks like above is another set of eyes, but actually those aren't eyes. Those teeth are so big that those holes in the top of the head are actually slots because when it closes its mouth, the teeth are too big and they go straight through the top of the head. Um, and they use those teeth to catch other fish like piranhas. And when they eat the fish, they're not just eating the piranha, they're eating everything that that piranha has ever eaten. And if that piranha is going around looking for little pieces of um, a little tiny fish, it will often eat little small specks that are sometimes the plastics that get into the river. And when that biara eats that piranha, it's also eating the plastic and that's getting into that fish's uh, gut in its stomach. But those fish are eaten by these guys. And you might recognize this um, uh, around uh, the British Isles and um, up where you guys are, you might have some river otters, um, our own species here. But this is a much bigger counter, uh, counterpart. This is the giant river otter. They can get three meters long and they are absolutely adapted to getting fish in the murky brown river of the Amazon. Um, so you see those giant great big flipper like feet that he has webbed so that they can fast move through the, uh, through the water. That giant flapping tail and across his head you can see those whis whiskers, those really sensitive whiskers that those are the actually called vibrissae and they can use that um, those vibrissae on their face to uh, even if there's a tiny flick of a fish's tail those um, those hundreds of hairs can prick in different air in different ways and tell that um, otter exactly where those fish are but it's not just otters that catch other fish it's also animals like this here this is a jabaroo stork it's got an absolutely giant giant wingspan three three and a half meters long um, and they just wait and lurk for uh, to grab those big fish and they can catch things just like the otters just as big as um, a bayara that vampire fish we just saw but when they eat the, the vampire fish, as the same we said before, they're also eating everything that that vampire fish has ever eaten and everything that those animals that the vampire fish ate have ever eaten. And that then is accumulating all of that plastic up into that bird. But this guy will catch those birds. I don't know if anybody uh, immediately knows what this animal is. Uh, this is, uh, it's not a crocodile. Uh, it's not an alligator. 
Uh, it's a relative of the crocodiles and alligators. This is the largest crocodilian in the entirety of the Americas, so all of North America and South America. Uh, this is the black caiman, and they can reach up to 17 feet in length. Absolutely giant animals, and they will sit waiting by the sides of the riverbanks on these sandbanks here, and they'll be really quiet, absolutely really, really still, and they can catch animals like this jabberoo stork. They can also catch sometimes, but rarely they'll catch the otters. Um, but I wonder, do you guys know what, if there's possibly any animal that could eat this? Because a 17 foot long, giant, great big black cane, and it seems pretty unlikely that you'll find something capable of taking an animal like this down. Well, one thing that's amazing about the black caiman and that stops most animals from is on its back, you can see it has these scale-like structures. They're actually made of bone and they're really, really strong. And it's like having an armor plating all over it. And perhaps that's why these guys have stayed alive in our ecosystems, our natural habitats, for even longer than the dinosaurs. Millions of years ago, these guys were still existing in some kind of variation across the world because they have just incredible adaptations. One of which being that armor plating that allows them to get away from animals. But there is one creature that can take them down. Uh, it's got four paws. Uh, it's related to an animal you guys might have living in your house, some of you. Um, and it's very spotty. It is, in fact, the jaguar. This is an absolutely brilliant animal. I've been searched, I had been searching for one of these guys for eight years. I'd done a couple of uh, expeditions in the Amazon and one in Mexico, trying to find a jaguar. Uh, and I'd never been lucky. I was working with some university students and we'd be out there and they would be coming for sort of short stints. And I'd be out there for several months at a time and they would go out and sometimes the students would come back having been there for about a week and they'd say, Dan, Dan, you never guess what we've just found. We were walking along down the trail and right there was a jaguar and I've always just all, very happy that those guys have got to see one but always eluded me never really got the chance to see one and so this last year last January I went on a really big expedition all about finding the jaguar because they are just incredible animals and we did actually manage to see one right at the end it was a really truly magical moment um, but this guy here the reason that they are the king of the Amazon rainforest isn't just because of their size because they have the strongest bite force of any cat in the world. So that means that the strength that they can bite down, bite down their mouths with is stronger than that of a tiger, which is much larger. It's stronger than that pound for pound of a lion. They are really amazing animals and they are also incredibly intelligent. And there's one part of this animal that that jaguar knows is the weak point. And I don't know if you can right now, but if you feel your skull, it's on your head. It's very, very hard, really strong, but right at the back, it gets a bit softer. And it's much more the case with a black caiman. So the jaguar knows that right at the back of the head of the black caiman is the part where it needs to get there, bite it and get its food as quickly as possible to avoid uh, getting hurt itself and to make sure that it gets that meal. And if you don't believe me that that's a possibility that these guys can do, take a look at this. It's a little grisly, but this is just showing the true might and power of a jaguar and how absolutely incredible they are. They are. This here was taken on the Brazilian Pantanals, a stretch where this happens very regularly. These jaguars go and pick off these black caiman. But when they eat them, as we were saying before, another thing that's going into these fantastic animal stomachs, something you would never believe would be in such a fan, a, an animal like this, is plastic. And plastic has been found in jaguar stomachs. I mean, this is really showing us that plastics are just not an ocean problem. They are across, um, across all kinds of different watercourses. Um, and, but how does it get there? This is, the, this is the thing, you know, how does that plastic get into the rivers? Well, what's interesting is plastic doesn't biodegrade. So when we're thinking about biodegrading, that's the process by which natural processes break down and naturally forming uh, substance to the, um, or naturally produce substance uh, by which that then breaks down and slowly turns into natural chemicals that can then um, cycle back and be used again. Plastic photodegrades, uh, which means that by light 
it will break down into smaller pieces, but never actually properly break down, or it'll take millions of years for it to break down properly, um, which is why it's such a difficult problem. It's why you can find plastic down at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, one of the deepest places in the entire world, um, why plastic from uh, hundreds of years ago, well, the tens and tens of years ago can still exist. I actually went down a mine, uh, an old abandoned slate mine, uh, with some friends last weekend, and we found an old packet of water Walker's crisps down there from the 1970s and it was almost perfectly kept, uh, uh, kept. and of course if we were talking about a naturally forming um, uh, packaging for example what indigenous people in the Amazon would previously use to carry their food banana leaves that would definitely be gone within weeks months days um, so how does it get into the uh, into the rivers well because it breaks down into these smaller pieces it actually if even if you drop one little piece of, let's think, use this as an example, if you drop a plastic bottle in the middle of a city, right? It could take a very long time for that plastic bottle to break down, but it's still gonna exist there. And actually, as it does break down, it gets smaller and smaller pieces, which are more easily blown around by wind and the elements. And then that plastic and those small pieces that's broken down will go to, they'll, as they're blown around, where are they most likely to go? Well, they're going to lower down and they're gonna end up in places like river street, rivers, streams and water courses. And that's why it's so important to never throw plastic on the floor because it will always end up in some kind of water course and that will take it straight out into the oceans or to the rivers. And because it lasts for such a long period of time, it can go, even all of that plastic that can be an ocean species might then go into um, river systems and be eaten by river animals. It's all one big um, bad problem, really, to be honest. Um, but it's not just that. Here, just like in the ocean, in rivers, uh, like you can see here, the ocean, uh, the, there's fishermen who lose their fishing gear and that gets stuck and tangled up in rivers and not just the problems of actual, uh, the plastic itself uh, being a problem inside, but that can actually tangle up animals. Um, and sadly, uh, where a few years ago, I was uh, in the Amazon and uh, the, the fishermen had lost their line and a few days later they found it again, but it actually had a bird, an anhinga, a type of heron-like bird that had flown down to catch a fish and just got tangled up in the uh, plastic. So it's not just the fish and the river animals, it can actually directly affect birds as well, which is really, really sad. Uh, but it's not just that, this is also a big problem in rivers. It can be quite expensive to get rid of waste in so many different areas in the world. Um, and we're very lucky, you know, in Northern Ireland and in England and across the British Isles, we have uh, some very good waste management systems uh, and it can be easy to get rid of waste in many different ways. And also there's a lot of education about plastic, about waste. Um, but unfortunately, without access to this in many other parts of the world, especially in places like uh, like the Amazonian countries, there just isn't access to this and they can dump it in rivers. And that's very, very common. There's also not the education um, available to these people in a lot of senses to know that they shouldn't be uh, putting that into the river because it will end up harming them in the long run. Um, it's very, very sad. But here are those tiny little pieces of plastic that have photodegraded and degraded through the elements as we were talking about. And some of the issues that can happen in the river with these tiny pieces of plastic. So they might be eaten by shrimp, they might be eaten by fish. And what can happen is these small pieces of plastic, just like the ones you can see there, can get into the fish and they can't be digested. So they fill up the stomach. And then that gives that fish a false sense of fullness, like it's had a big meal, but obviously it's not getting any nutrition from it. And they can also block up the gut um, and block up their tummy, which can give them infections. And sadly, they can die from, from those problems as well. But another big problem, and you'll have heard about this potentially in the oceans, is when they finally get to a point of microplastics. And that's why it's so important for us to get them while they're bigger pieces and make sure that we put them in the right places and make sure that we don't keep piling on more plastic to this problem because those tiny tiny little microscopic pieces of plastic called microplastics when they get to this size can actually bind to other chemicals so these little tiny pieces of plastic can bind um, to uh, very harmful chemicals some called heavy metals and actually as something breaks down and gets smaller and separates its surface area so the amount around each tiny particle gets bigger and bigger and bigger um, which means more and more 
uh, harmful chemicals and particles can bind to that piece of plastic or stick to it and cause uh, damage inside. And that's uh, what can be really harmful for us because as we looked at all of those species before, many of those species are actually eaten by people as well across all of the Amazon, across all of the river systems across the world. Fish even in Northern Ireland um, that might have been eating pieces of plastic are eaten by people and fished out of the water. So it's super important that we're aware of the actual real damaging effects of plastic. So such a large proportion of the ocean plastic comes from rivers. So why have we not been talking about it for such a long time? Well, it's because we haven't really associated it with that. We haven't thought about the fact that ocean, that plastics goes into the ocean. And so it's really understudied. We don't know that much about it compared to in the oceans. Um, so, and also that's the quickest place that it's going to end up in. You might be um, in uh, a town or a village uh, that's not close to uh, the sea or even in the middle of a city, and you might think, no, that would never end up in the sea, so my problem with plastic's never gonna be that big of an issue. But actually, anywhere you are near to a river, that plastic could end up in there, and very quickly, as soon as it's gone in a river, it's one place it's gonna go, is the ocean. So the really the most important things with plastic are to reuse, reduce, and recycle. So when you're thinking about re Think about all of the animals all over the world. I mean, this could be in the Amazon, it could be in Northern Ireland, it could be anywhere. These same things are so important. So to reuse stuff. So say you have gone out and you're gonna go shopping, make sure that you bring a backpack to go and uh, bring your food home in. Don't get into that position where you're, um, where you're going uh, to, to the shop and you have no bags to put your food in, so you have to get plastic bags. One way that I uh, remember to do that is I put my backpack on the hook by the front door. So if I forget it before I go out shopping, I remember it right as I'm leaving the house because it's right there on the door. Um, and also it's a lot easier because it goes on your back. I love that. So if you're not carrying your big bags home made of plastic, uh, it's much more comfortable on your back. But that's the same with coffee cups and drinks cups as well. If you're going to a place that serves drinks, it would be super important for you to bring a reusable bamboo or otherwise uh, cup that you can get your drink filled up to in there. So you're not adding um, to that problem of, uh, of plastic. It's so important. And there's so many different sorts of reusable things that you can get uh, where it goes goes to washing detergents, toothbrushes, there's so many different things um, and there's lots of shops around that are popping up um, for, uh, to, to reduce single-use uh, plastic and, and just reducing it. So um, we'll get to my plastic promise which is specifically about reducing in a minute uh, but reducing is another one where you can decide on certain things. So if you, there's a local fruit and veg shop uh, that has loose fruit and veg, maybe opt to go there sometimes rather than picking up the plastic wrapped ones. Um, or maybe don't go and buy the food that is in a plastic wrapped bag. Maybe pick something that doesn't have plastic in it. Or maybe it's just a situation of don't buy so much food out or get uh, meals out in shops like M&S or in Tesco or in, um, or in Morrison's or all of those. Instead, make the food at home and bring in sandwiches yourself in a reusable um, little tub. That's a great one. But um, another one is, of course, recycling. It's so critically important to recycle as much as possible. Um, it's all really, really straightforward now, really easy to do. There's so many different ways that we can make sure that we're recycling the things that we use, but that goes across the board, whether it's the recycling from your kitchen, recycling clothes is another one. If there's something your friend really likes that they're not wearing any uh, much anymore, um, and there's something that you have that they want, you could do a swap so that you're not buying new clothes, for example, that's a great one. And many, many clothes have plastic fibers in them. Um, so that's a really, really good one as well. Um, but onto my plastic promise. Guys, I really urge you, I think it's such a fantastic thing to do to make your plastic promise. So after this webinar, please do head over and do uh, and make your plastic promise pledge uh, like I did earlier. My, plas uh, my plastic promise um, is to, uh, like I was just saying there, sometimes when I'm going out and I'm looking for um, something to eat for the evening, I'll buy my uh, tomatoes or my, uh, or my veg or my fruit in those little bags that, um, that, that have little plastic around them, single use plastic. Uh, and, I've, and my plastic promise is to stop using those now and uh, to instead stock up on fruit from the local fruit and veg market so that I'm not adding to that plastic problem um, from that specific part. So it's one small step uh, in the right direction. 
So thank you so much, guys. Um, I, I've had an absolutely lovely time talking about the Amazon. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me talk about it as much as I love to talk about it. I'd love uh, to hear some of your questions and to hear um, if you'd like to know anything about the Amazon or about plastic in the Amazon, or, um, or if you just want to hear any more stories about it, because I could go on for a very long time. But thank you very, very much uh, for having me. Dan, do you want to unshare your screen just so that we can? There we go. Yeah. There we go. Just waiting on Claire coming on. Um, Claire's just compiling some of the questions. Just a quick few, I suppose, that um, maybe I had that some of our young people might be interested in. How yeah. did you, I suppose, Dan, get interested and involved in this type of work? Or say we had like a young activist or somebody there that was really interested in this. How would you inspire them, I suppose, to get involved in this kind of work that you do? Yeah, I mean, fall into it as such. Uh, one thing that's so amazing about the world that we're in today is that there's just so many opportunities for young people. People are listening to young people today more than they ever have. In, in history. Look at young Greta Thunberg and how much power she's had in influencing the entire world. So I think the first thing is just start talking about it today because you have a platform today more than you have ever had in the, in the past. People are now starting to realize that really the future of this planet is in the hands of the people who are coming up right now. And there are so many young activists and people who are so passionate about this. Um, but for me personally, I was always really, really interested in science in school, but I was also interested in so many other different things. I loved art, I loved drama, uh, I loved theatre studies, and I, um, I loved English. I loved them all really, but my two greatest things were art and science. Um, and I, so for me, I just worked really, really, really hard at biology. To be honest, I wasn't very good at um, some of my other sciences. I wasn't the best person in the class at physics, but I really, really tried at biology and I just worked really, really hard. And after, um, and then when I got to my later stages in school, my GCSEs, I made sure that I picked triple award or triple sciences, as many science options as I could. And then when I got to A-level, um, which is a later on stage, I took, um, I made sure that I did biology uh, and I did chemistry and I did mathematics um, as well as art as well uh, so I kept that other uh, other thing going as well and then after that um, it was kind of an obvious thing I was I was like I, I kind of wanted to do art but I was like the, I love wildlife and I'd always been obsessed with um, with Charles Darwin and his amazing uh, notebooks that he'd made because all of these old explorers and naturalists and biologists they made these beautiful sketched notebooks about um, animals from their from their um, from their explorations and their travels and that always inspired me and so it felt like one straightforward path uh, and I went to study uh, zoology which is a, uh, a it, which is a, a type of biology focused primarily on animals um, at university and then started working abroad um, uh, after that zoology degree which opened those doors to me going to these beautiful places and then um, yeah started making little films and doing the art side and it all came into one very exciting life um, and how many times i'm supposed for some of our young people have you actually visited the amazon to see some of these real issues that are there yeah so um i've been in the amazon for the best part of total uh over just over a year of my life but i've been in with for that year it's been four separate occasions that i've been there um but then uh, it's not just the amazon so all of these issues are so common across loads of different tropical places um you see big problems associated with large-scale overpopulation so loads of people in india india is about to overtake china as the most populated country in the world it's about it's most likely to happen around 2027 when that's going to happen so big issues there and we saw tigers and just how small their areas were and they have big problems with plastic pollution in india as well but then across to the Philippines, very similar story, much of Southeast Asia, um, but it's all across them. Those countries, they really do suffer from plastic pollution, as do many parts of the world. Dan Bell, who's age nine from Straban Primary School, has asked, was it dangerous or were you scared around all those wild animals? I love this question because typically the, the sort of explorers that you see on television, they're all like, no, no, I wasn't scared. Of course I wasn't scared. I'm an explorer. The answer is they were scared and I was scared too. It is scary. There are some really scary things, but, but interestingly, what you think might be scary, like the big ones, the caiman, the black caiman, like you saw there, the crocodile like thing, uh, the jaguars, uh, they're not the scary ones. The scary ones are the little 
little cr creepy crawlies. I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to put you off the Amazon because it is absolutely beautiful. It's a really lovely place and it's great to visit. Uh, and when you're older, I'm sure it'll be uh, just as, uh, you, you'll be just as excited to go, but the snakes and the creepy crawlies can be very poisonous and venomous. Um, and there's one particular snake called the Ferdilance, or as they call it in Guyana, the Labaria. Um, and it's completely hidden. It's really camouflaged. Um, it's, it's got this incredible um, mosaic-like diamond brown and tan uh, coloration on its back. And that allows it to just stay very silently in the undergrowth. And when we get to a new camp, so we're sleeping in hammocks along the side of the water, um, along the river, and that's all we've got. We've got no tents, we've got no buildings, there's no uh, showers or baths or anything. There's just our hammocks and the river. And when we get there, we have to, sh we bring a rake because we have to make sure that we get rid of all of the um, scary, creepy crawlies and we put down a tarpaulin in a piece of plastic so that we can see if anything's come onto it because the most dangerous thing in the Amazon, the two most dangerous things are if a tree falls on you, there's not much you can do about that. And the other one is um, the labaria, the snakes, because if you're bitten by one of those in the middle of the jungle, um, well, you're not gonna have a very good day. Dan, what about littering? When you've been out in Amazon or just in your local area, have you seen any real bad littering and you think that there's ways that we can go about reducing that and the impact that that has had on any animals that you've seen? So I'll say um, the good and the bad. So in certain places in the Philippines. Uh, I was just out there just before uh, this lockdown happened. I was in the Philippines. I'm incredibly lucky to get that sort of spell of um, travel or something happening before we were closed down for such a long period of time. But out there, um, there was incredible amounts of plastic pollution. I mean, there are some, and it's all about education and it's changing in lots of places. And some of the most pioneering and incredible biologists come from countries like the Philippines. And a lot of them are young people. It was actually a young person, a very, very young person who came up with the idea in, um, in Southeast Asia. Uh, these great big sewage um, uh, pipes were coming out of the cities and people were throwing plastic into the rivers and into the sewage system and these big pipes were just firing all of that plastic out to the oceans and it was a very young person um, who came up with the idea why don't we just put giant nets over the ex exits of them um, and as people probably did they were like oh you're all very young you don't know what you're talking about but this kind of person obviously did know what they were talking about because what they did is they put these very big powerful nets um, and hooked them out and you can look at pictures on, uh, of them online and they just allowed the water to come out and they collected all of that plastic and then they could take that plastic away and it didn't fire its way out to the, into the ocean. So that was probably, that's those kinds of areas are where I see a lot of the, mo the biggest plastic pollution problems but also some of the biggest solutions. But then um, just in a happy sense, uh, when you go into the really remote Amazon, which is still absolutely pristine, there are still beautiful parts of the world left to preserve. And when we were going out, we would bring boats up these waterfalls and go through the jungle and hack our way through to get as far, far remote as we absolutely could. And, um, and out there, there's absolutely uh, no sign plastic and we would go out there and I think there's a kind of unspoken thing about the people who go out to those places that if you if you go there you leave it exactly the way that you found it um, and so out in the remote Amazon we didn't see another person for six weeks and um, we didn't see a single piece of plastic the entire time we were up there and it was absolutely beautiful and um, so there are places um, in the world that are still absolutely pristine and if we stop um, littering now um, have a much better chance of staying that way forever. Great. Dan, there's another one here from Leah who said, what is the biggest tree in the Amazon rainforest? Um, that's a really interesting one. Um, so it completely depends on where you are in the jungle because the trees um, in the very high part of the Amazon are very different to the ones that you might find in the southern parts of the Amazon. Um, and the, it looks like one big forest, the Amazon, um, but uh, it's actually made up of lots of different forests. And in the top is called the Guyana Shield. And it's made on this great big slab of granite, which is a, a type of rock that you might see. And on that part of the forest, there's a specific uh, sort of tree called a silk cotton tree, or its local name is a kapok tree. And they just go absolutely hundreds of feet into the air. They, and there's Amerindian, so um, old uh, indigenous uh, folklore and myth, myths and legends that those trees hold up the sky 
because they're so tall. And what's re- and and in and slightly further south, the Brazil nut trees are very very similar to those. And those ones, I don't know if you guys have had Brazil nuts, but they come from that tree. Um, but what's really amazing about those absolutely giant trees is when they get up to the top, they're very straight. There's no branches that come off, and then right at the top, they just go like that. And harpy eagles, the most powerful bird of prey in the entire world, giant great big bird, you'll have seen it in that video, the great big grey one with a beautiful crest. 90% of harpy eagles in the north, in that forest, are in that silk cotton tree, and 90% in the south in the Amazon nest in the Brazil nut tree. Those really tall trees, and they pick them because of that. So they're not just the tallest trees, but they also have the biggest bird. So, very cool. Um, so there's another question here. Um, don't you think there's a strong and urgent need to ban production of single-use plastics? Absolutely. I think there is no, there's no other argument to that now. We have other options. We have ability to use other things. Um, you can even see it just as much as going to co-op, um, which have, a, with, have those green uh, biodegradable plastic bags. Uh, we do not need to be using the plastic anymore. There are other biodegradable um, types that we have. These companies that are making these plastics already have a large amount of money and they should be using um, what they've got to make the world a better place and still manage to make a large amount of profit, lots more than many other people in the world will ever be able to make in their lifetime. And so I think there is an absolutely giant urge that we need to stop uh, using single-use plastics now because we're going to destroy our environments. And at the end of the day, if we destroy our environments, we're only destroying it for ourselves. Um, and I think that that has to come from a governmental situation as well, because it's very difficult to get certain people to do things um, without getting everybody to do them at the same time. We have a question from Abby Gillespie in Strabane Primary, age nine. Um, Abby, Abby has asked, have you, um, have you ever actually been hurt in the rainforest or anything kind of dangerous happened to you while you're there? Um, so I, um, I do know people who've had some issues in the rainforest. It's very, very rare because when you go to the rainforest, usually the people who go there have been, um, have gone through some kind of understanding that, that you don't, um, you don't do silly things. So one of those, for example, is if you're in the jungle, you never, ever wake up in the middle of the night and go uh, to the bathroom or go anywhere without putting on some wellies or some big boots. That's just a common thing. Anyone who goes to the jungle knows that. But unfortunately, um, I was in Mexico uh, last year and I was working as a habitat scientist leading student university students um, into the jungles. And we were uh, doing lots of different kinds of measurements. We were catching bats at night and birds in the day and ringing them and l- l- doing lots of interesting things with the science. But sadly, um, we one of the camps, and it was actually quite a built up area, this one, um, one, uh, one of my students woke up in the middle of the night and uh, she walked out to go to the bathroom, didn't put her shoes on, and she stood on something and she got out a little pain. Um, she went to the bathroom, she went back to her tent and fell asleep. And um, in the morning, she woke up and her leg was all bruised and uh, blackened and everything. And actually, she had stood on that snake that I told you about, the Ferdilance, but it didn't envenomate. So it didn't it didn't actually fire out the toxins that it carries, it's venom inside its um, in cheeks. And that's uh, very luckily for her, um, because it wouldn't have been very, it wouldn't have been good for her if it had. But um, uh, snakes are just like us, if they, uh, they don't want to use their energy or use their resources if they don't need to. And what happened in that specific situation is she stood on the snake and it was like, ow, that really hurts, why are you doing this? And it gave her a warning bite, which was like, leave me alone. Um, but it didn't want to use that venom inside because it uses that venom on its actual food. And it knew that this giant, great big object standing on it, there's no way it was going to be able to eat it. So it didn't use its venom. And that's actually very common, 60% of bites to humans from those Ferdinand snakes are uh, non-envenomated. Um, but even just the tiniest little amount which did come out, let her leg go that colour. Um, so no, n- personally, I've actually always been fine, but it, it does happen very rarely, but it does happen. So Pooja has asked, can you tell us something, some difference between forests found in India and Brazil? 
Mm, there are beautiful differences in India. So um, last Christmas, um, I actually went to my friend's wedding in India and it was really, really beautiful, beautiful colours, the uh, yellows and turmerics and the, uh, all amazing things. But when uh, I went up to her wedding, um, we thought, well, we're in India, so let's go and see some tigers. Uh, and so we went up to Ranthambore National Park in the north near New Delhi in the Rajasthan um, area. And it was absolutely stunning. And where you imagine the jungles in South America, you know, these kind of trees behind me, these really heavy green kind of um, messy trees everywhere you'll see. I'll just show you. I've got lots of jungle jungle in my um, in my room here. Um, that's actually very different to the kinds of habitats that you'll see in India. And, um, oh, it's not here, but I would have shown you. Um, the tigers of India in the north, it's actually a kind of browny, scrubby forest with the trees slightly further apart. And it's very easy to walk through. Whereas in the jungle, you need a machete to get through all of the tangled roots and vines. In India, it's very flat um, and uh, very dusty and the trees are far, far apart. Um, it's a, a very, very different, um, eerily beautiful habitat in both senses, yeah. Um, we have Wesley from Sabran Primary asking you, uh, which country do you think is the most advanced in waste management that you have came across to date? Hmm, that's an interesting one. Um, I mean, probably uh, the Netherlands, actually. I went to the Netherlands and um, there I didn't see any plastic around. <laughs> I went there. It's very, no, I mean, we we still have a lot of issues here um, in in the British Isles. Um, uh, in in England, for where I am, we definitely have a lot of uh, a lot of plastic issues. Um, probably a lot less. I would imagine in Northern Ireland here, um, but in uh, the Netherlands, it's very it's very um, it's very pristine. They have a uh, it's th those Scandinavian countries do a fabulous job. Norway, uh, Sweden. Um, they really, they, yeah, really beautiful. But as, in terms of countries outside of the EU, outside of the um, European Union, um, the Philippines are doing some pretty amazing things because they've had to deal with really bad plastic pollution. They are, they're coming up with pretty ingenious ways to do it. Um, so yeah, uh, I've seen, while I've seen the worst pollution there, I've also seen some of the most amazing cleanup situations as well. Dan Zara's asking, which is your favorite animal in the Amazon rainforest? Um, oh, it's so hard to pick. It's so hard because they're all my favourites for so many different reasons. Um, pick one. I mean, can ask who's your favourite child. You can pick one. <laughs> who's, who's my favourite? It's like being asked who's your favourite child and parents say I can't yeah. pick one. No, I know. God, yeah. <laughs> it is. I mean, uh, you know what? Because actually there's nothing worse than somebody who says I couldn't pick, so I'm going to pick one for you. Yeah. Right. I would say it's probably... Uh, it's probably the Jaguar, purely because when you see one and you've searched for such a long time, it gives you this feeling of kind of, um, it feels like you're seeing a mythical creature, something from a storybook, because they just are absolutely beautiful. And another amazing thing about them is they just don't mind you at all because they're very well aware that they're the king of the jungle. And when they see you, they just look at you. And then they just saunter off, they swan off, walk really slowly because, yeah, they know that you can't, you can't get them. Okay. And we have a question from Leah Kenneth. She said that she had saw a river near her with uh, lots of plastic and what could she do about it or maybe to help fix that issue? Um, there's so many different things that you can do. One thing is, um, uh, a, don't add to the problem. So if you see an area where there's a lot of plastic there, um, you know that somebody's made that plastic get there. That's because people have put plastic in the, in the wrong bins, for example, or they've uh, thrown plastic on the floor. So the first thing that I would say to do is just to, to see that and be aware that that's actually the result of people's actions. And you have an action too, and you have a choice by which you manage your waste. And so don't throw plastic on the floor. Another one would be to call the local council and tell them there is a specific issue in that area so that they might be more aware of it. And maybe uh, adding on more uh, pressure will help uh, make, uh, make them make more decisions to clean up that specific problem. Um, and also if it's safe and if, you're, uh, and if you organize it with adults and parents, maybe go and do a cleanup in those areas. Some uh, rivers actually have little beaches similar to the ocean. And um, I think it would be a fantastic thing to do because we see loads of people 
talking about going and doing a beach clean at the ocean or wouldn't it be great to do a river clean and to go and get those more obvious pieces of plastic from the side of rivers okay i'm just looking with another one from the primary school um which country wasn't what you expected it to be like when you got there that's a really good question um india india actually um uh, I mean, the Amazon, when I first went, I'm honest, I, I cried like a little baby. I went into the jungle and I was like, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, but India, I thought, I went in Christmas and I was like, oh, I'm escaping. I'm escaping the cool, cold, biting weather of England. And I went over and it was really cold in India, actually, in the north. It, it was quite, it was quite snow, uh, it was quite uh, chilly, uh, especially during the night. And also when I went to see the tigers in uh, Ranthambore National Park, um, it was... Uh, it was really um, eerie and dusty and kind of almost almost a bit deserty in a way. It was really interesting. But, but India is such an unbelievably diverse place. When you think of India in the words of Jungle Book, you know, with your black leopard and you, you've got the bears, it's, and, and it's all very jungle-like. Actually, India does have jungle, but it's also got that scrubby uh, sort of brownie forest that I talked about before. But even high up in the north, in a place called Ladakh are snowy Himalayan mountains where you can see snow leopards. So India is a really diverse and beautiful place and I just hadn't realised that so much until I went there myself. Um, I'm just having another one here. Um, we have Pooja asking, will plastic bag bans increase or decrease the use of other plastic products? As in, if we, if we stopped using them, do you think we'll see a a greater increase in other plastic pro products or do you think in general will reduce? Plastic, what was the first thing, sorry? What? Sorry, plastic bag ban. So if there was a ban on oh. plastic bags, do you think we'd yeah. see an increase or a decrease in the use of other plastic products? I think with plastic bags I would say probably a decrease because that's one thing that we just go and get and we throw away so many people I mean we've all been guilty of it I've definitely been guilty of it myself uh, especially many years ago just going to Tesco buying food putting them in the plastic bags and then those plastic bags even though you've got them in the cupboard still you just add them to the pile of plastic bags in the cupboard um, and I think if people aren't allowed to use those plastic bags anymore at all then that problem is completely erased and think about the amount of plastic that is as well it's a huge amount and think that you've all just got that bag for life and, and they say to you no you can't actually use those bags anymore you have to use a backpack or a bag for life that is an absolutely massive amount of plastic that's got that fills that one type of thing that we use it for gone and so i think while that might not increase other sorts of plastic it just removes that one problem so yeah and with regard to other plastics and whether they might change things i'm not so sure but i think with that one it would be a mostly a positive great and then we have kyuk chung lee uh, do you think the plastic in the amazon is microplastics washed through the soil do you think that's an issue so plastic in the amazon um it's it's the microplastics are i mean it's over the over the huge amounts of years that um are, have, have uh the plastic has been being used by uh people in capital cities in uh, towns and villages and even the indigenous populations um it has been photodegrading so it has been getting smaller and smaller and smaller and going through the soils just as you're saying but i mean it's a situation that um it's happening everywhere in the world the indigenous populations primarily in guyana always used to use banana leaves and other sorts of leaves to carry their food and to carry their things they use wicker baskets and now because plastic is easier to use you know you can't you can't knock people for using the same things that we're using here it's easier they know that they can wash it a bunch of times and they can keep using the same thing their wicker baskets take them hours and days to create whereas this they can just get for almost nothing um, in, in a local city and when those break down um, or they snap or they crack they just chuck them they chuck them on the floor because they don't know any better because no one's told them the actual extent of it and so as they get left behind they break down and they photodegrade into smaller pieces and those ones might filter through the soil system and get into the river courses or they might just be dumped in the river themselves and start breaking down in there or be eaten by something that then cycles in a different way so yeah it's a it's a big problem did you come across just on that point did you come across any educational programs when you were out that way as in educating the young people and the locals around the difficulties and the issues that plastics i suppose come about with when we use them mm -hmm. 
Um, in the Philippines, yes. So uh, that was awesome because they are just so on it. And the young people in the Philippines, they just, they, they are aware of problems. They're uh, illegal wildlife trade and um, shooting of endangered species and the problems with plastic. The younger generation in the Philippines are switched on to that sort of stuff. And that's because they talk about it in schools. Um, uh, this, this fantastic giant bird, uh, the national bird of the Philippines, the Philippine eagle, the most endangered eagle in the entire world. Um, so I'm the patron of their organization. I absolutely love Philippine eagles. Um, I love all birds, but that bird is just magnific magnificent. It's got a big old mullet down, uh, down its back of this huge big red crust. And um, they love that bird in the Philippines. They're a bird that it got so endangered because people killed it. Now the younger generation absolutely love that they get to call that bird their national bird and they do so much to protect it. And when I went there, I uh, spoke to the university about the bird, spoke to the schools, but they'd already, they have talks all the time from uh, different organizations coming in and they're so open to it. And that's happening everywhere. Guyana, there's um, in this local uh, indigenous community, uh, the Makushi people living in Yupakari village, this little village in the middle of the, uh, this great big area called the Rupanuni loads of savannah lands and rainforests in this tiny little village they have a conservation team that are all indigenous run and um, they do lots of different things to make people aware about plastic about hunting about lots about how populations go down and we need them to stay up and even they um, it's a delicacy it's something people love to eat is turtle eggs and so what they've done is they've got lots of people to go out and they collect the eggs and they hatch them in the village and then they release the babies so the eggs don't be uh, aren't eaten so there are loads of amazing things being talked about and done all over the world uh, and what's great about the young generation is as we're going up and things like social media are increasing and everybody's getting more um more uh you know connected that allows people all over the world even in these indigenous communities to speak to people like you guys you can you can you know, you can all talk to one another and you can share information and share knowledge. And that's what's so exciting, I think, about the, the future generations. Well, Dan, I'm sorry we're gonna have to suppose stop you there because there's a few questions we didn't get to, but um, I can't thank you enough. It's been absolutely fantastic. And I'm really happy we even seen the younger ones engaging with us today. Um, and I wanna thank everybody out there for attending. It's been absolutely fantastic. I just wanna do a few quick reminders. So can I remind you all, like Dan did today, was to do your plastic promise. Um, and if you weren't able to attend today, don't worry, it will be on our YouTube channel and our EcoSchools NI. Um, we'll have a recording of that. So if there's any teachers out there and you want to show it with your pupils, please feel free to do that. And you'll get, um, I know Claire's just shared in the chat where you can download your certificate of attendance today, but there'll also be an email with that. And please follow us on social and on our websites for our future webinars, because there's lots coming up and really exciting. Um, but again, thank you to Dan. Um, I've had a great thank time. So I'm really enjoying. So it was lovely meeting you. Thank you so much for having me guys. And thanks so much to all of you for coming. Um, I just love talking about the Amazon. Um, and I love that I've been able to share some of my stories and also to talk to you guys. Thanks for the questions as well. And make your plastic promise um, and stick to it.